Good morning, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's event, Gender Justice and Accountability, Atrocity Crimes and the Protection of Witness and Survivors. My name is Ariella Blatter, and I am president of WISE, Women in International Security. We are a non-governmental organization promoting gender equality by helping women advance as leaders in international peace and security. For 35 years, our unique global organization has supported professional growth opportunities for women and led gender equality research projects, policy engagement initiatives, and nurtured a community of powerful security advocates, expert leaders, and mentors. Our network spans nearly 50 countries across six continents and includes 15,000 members who are committed to closing the gender equality gap worldwide. Our event today will focus on the issue of gender justice and accountability for the protection of witnesses and survivors of crimes against humanity. This weekend, we celebrated December 10th, which marks International Human Rights Day, and the last day in the UN Women's 16 Days of Activism Against Gender-Based Violence, which calls for the end of all forms of gender-based violence. The elimination of gender-based violence requires robust mechanisms to hold perpetrators accountable and ensure justice for survivors. It has been 20 years since the International Criminal Court has been become operational, and 22 years since the Rome Statute entered into force, which I myself had the opportunity to work on witness protection provisions for survivors of sexual assault, in which we sought to balance the rights of the accused and the accuser, where the trauma of the courtroom balanced on the risks of life to livelihood, which remained an acute threat. And sadly, today we're facing the same discussion. Reports of threats and reprisals, again, come to bear on witnesses and survivors who participate in investigations and prosecutions of atrocity crimes, which become increasingly common. In Myanmar, we see numerous cases where individuals willing to testify against senior officials in the military have been killed or disappeared, and we're seeing similar cases in Syria and Ukraine. Our discussion today will look at existing international efforts to support witnesses, specifically women and other underrepresented groups, and we'll explore how we can integrate a gender perspective into witness protection measures and advance global accountability. I want to recognize our partner for this event, the Embassy of Liechtenstein, Washington, DC. Liechtenstein has been vocal in its support for advancing gender equality. WISE has enjoyed working alongside the Embassy of Liechtenstein for over six years, and we look forward to our future collaborations. I'm delighted to now welcome and introduce Mr. Georg Sparber, Ambassador of the Principality of Liechtenstein to the United States. Prior to becoming appointed Ambassador to the United States in 2021, Mr. Sparber held the position of Deputy Permanent Representative Liechtenstein to the United States in New York since January 2017. His portfolio includes disarmament, peace and security, and political issues. I know he is an ardent supporter of international justice. I turn it over to you, Mr. Ambassador, and look forward to hearing your remarks. Well, thank you so much, uh, dear Madam President, dear Ariela, dear panelists, and dear participants. Uh, very good morning to all of you and a good afternoon to those who join us from overseas. It's really a great pleasure to welcome you all to this discussion today on gender dimension of international criminal justice. This is a culmination of sorts of a number of foreign policy priorities for Liechtenstein. And it is also an excellent topic to wrap up a busy and successful year of cooperation between the Liechtenstein Embassy and WISE. So thank you, Arela, again for hosting us today on a topic which is at the very core, I believe, of the WISE mission. I'm very pleased that we will have the opportunity to discuss the current state of play of reflecting a gender dimension in accountability efforts, of course, there has been significant progress over the years in addressing sexual and gender-based violence in international criminal justice efforts. Landmark decisions were taken by the special tribunals, by the ICC, and also national justice systems in this regard. At the same time, we keep witnessing highly sexualized conflicts, the latest of which is, is Russia's brutal aggression against Ukraine. We know from the important work of international justice mechanisms to what alarming extent widespread patterns of sexual violence also characterize the conflicts in Syria and Myanmar. So where are we today in terms of our commitment to provide justice and accountability for these crimes? 
I believe we do have an exception group of panelists to discuss that question. They all share a very deep understanding of gender-based violence, non-conflict, and they all work proactively and in very concrete terms to close the impunity gap for such crimes. To do so not only entails a specialized legal understandings of the crimes committed, it also entails an approach at evidence gathering, at interviewing witnesses, at providing access to services, and it entails gender sensitive design of justice mechanisms themselves. Our discussion will address the critical need of deep and intersectional gender analysis to our understanding of how certain crimes have a differentiated impact on people, on women and girls, as well as men and boys. So without further ado, I hand it over to you, Ariella, for what will be a very interesting and informative panel discussion. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Ambassador. And I agree, we do have an excellent distinguished panel today. Uh, let me uh, give them a warm welcome and also introduce them to you. We're joined by Catherine marchi Uhel, the head of the International Impartial and Independent Mechanism, also known as the IIIM of the United Nations. Susan Notar, Senior Advisor at the Office of, Grim of Global Criminal Justice, U.S. Department of State Middle East team. We are also joined, I see, by Jennifer Glaudemans, both of the Office of Global Criminal Justice, and Susan has agreed to join us based on her specific Middle East experience. So thank you both for being here, and Susan, thank you for being here on camera for giving remarks. YY New, the Founder and Director of Women's Peace Network and Naomi Kikoler, the director of the Simon Skolt Center for the Prevention of Genocide at the US Holocaust Museum. I uh, invite our audience to review the panelists' bios added in the chat, and also to use the Q&A function to submit any questions you have for our panelists. I have an opening question for all of our panelists to respond to. As attacks on civilians continue, as we see in Ukraine, Syria, Myanmar and Tigray, just to name a few. There is a clear and pressing need to address conflict related gender based violence, to provide justice for such crimes and to adequately protect witnesses. What are the top challenges we are facing in achieving gender justice and accountability that you'd like our audience to know? Let me begin by asking this question to Catherine. Thank you, Ariella. Uh, thanks a lot. Uh the ambassador for inviting uh, me to, to be part of this uh, very interesting discussion. I'll be very brief on this first question, Ariella, and I'm looking forward obviously to, to going into more details in our discussion later on. There are indeed considerable uh, barriers to gender sensitive justice and ensuring that uh, witnesses of gender-based crimes, including of sexual violence, but not limited to it, are willing to come forward and related accountability efforts. And we see many of them in the Syrian context, obviously. These challenges include, but are not limited to, I will start with social stigma, obviously. Uh, for example, we heard during our consultation with civil society uh, partners that the first question Syrian former female detainees are asked is whether they've been subject to sexual violence. Um, the Syria Commission of Inquiry reported that female victims and survivors of uh, sexual violence can face divorce by their husbands, separation from their children even, certainly ostracization from their families and communities or even honor killings. These harmful consequences can be exacerbated when rape results in pregnancy. And by contrast, um, men have uh, uh, are less uh, regularly asked the same question, uh, but um, when they've been detained, I mean, but they've not, although they've not been routinely subject to the same assumptions, obviously, uh, obviously when they um, are, for instance, identified as having uh, been victim of sexual violence, then they can themselves face other psychological and physical harm even including feeling that they've lost their masculinity and cannot confide in others. And finally on this, as, as reported by the Secretary General of the United Nations, sexual violence is a primary uh, reason cited by persons of diverse sexual orientations and gender identities for fleeing Syria. So 
social stigma was clearly the first one that came to mind in terms of barrier. But I will mention that lack of adequate shelters for survivors of gender-based violence in Syria, and also alarmingly insufficient access to long-term psychological support are also clearly barriers displacement and restriction on the movement in particular of women and girls um, accentuate the, the barriers as well as immediate survival and security needs you, you don't come forward as a participant in a in a accountability process uh, even if you're not also, you're not against doing so if you are still striving for for surviving and, and meeting those needs uh, two last barriers i wanted to mention um, I would say that certainly biased investigative approaches have led, in, uh, led to gaps in evidence uh, reflecting gender perspective, and in particular, those of women, girls, and persons of diverse uh, sexual orientation and gender identities. You really need an environment that is conducive to receive, receiving these, uh, um, these accounts from, from uh, such victims and survivors. And finally, uh, in the context of Syria, obviously, uh, a disillusionment with justice prospect, which seem far off or unattainable, and, and especially for survivors uh, in Syria. I thank you. Thank you, Catherine. Thank you for giving us uh, a diverse perspective there on, on both on multiple gender perspectives. Um, let us have uh, in order Susan, YY, and Naomi follow uh, with responses to the question, Susan. Yeah, and thank you very much for asking me to join you today to discuss this important topic that we all spend quite a bit of time focusing on. I would say in addition to some of the um, problems that Catherine has outlined so well, I mean, underlying this whole part of our discussion is really the prevalence of sexual and gender-based violence and how it's used as a weapon of war to terrorize populations, whether it's Ukraine, Syria, Iraq, Burma, we see across all conflicts, the sheer numbers of victims. And as Catherine also noted, not only women, but children, men, boys, and we don't hear about those populations as well as intersectional communities who face terrible discrimination and threats to their lives as a result of their um, LGBTQI status. In addition, I would also say women need to have a seat at the table, whether it's women judges, women peacemakers, we don't see enough women at the table. And there have been studies that really demonstrate that that makes a difference in the justice process. Um, we are seeing glimmers of hope, I would say, in some of the cases that the ambassador has referred to, for example, in Germany, where, for example, ISIS is being held accountable in um, cases involving Yazidi victims, um, which is huge and really provides a great deal of solace, I would say, to victims. But we are also seeing that victims are asked to testify again and again and again about what happened to them and to be re-traumatized. A number of nations, for example, with our European allies <clears throat> are working together to create joint investigation teams so that they can draw from the pool of evidence that they're hearing from victims, including for example, Yazidi victims to prevent this type of re-traumatization. We also see linguistic challenges with some of the victims where, for example, with the Yazidis, which is an area in Iraq I have worked on a great deal, <clears throat> some of the people who are interviewing the Yazidis don't speak their language, which is Kurmanji, so not Kurdish, not Arabic. So we need to have people who understand their languages and we need psychologists who are trained to um, interview and help victims of trauma. And I'll just mention one more area briefly that we're also seeing, which is pregnancy resulting from rape and how this is used as a way to 
re-traumatize communities and then how it can really rent communities apart in the aftermath. For example, in Iraq, we saw it in the Al-Qaeda era, but we're also seeing it with ISIS with respect to the Yazidis, who um, there are many children born of rape and the Yazidi community um, has decided not to let the children back in because they consider them Arabic. But the problem is now wow, these children have a form of statelessness. Um, so I'll, I'll end there. Uh, thank you, uh, YY, your comments? Thank you very much, Ariel, and thank you very much uh, to the organizers for inviting me to this important discussion. So I'm very honored to join you all. Um, so gender justice and accountability is the issues that um, my organization, Women's Peace Network, and I have been working in Burma for, for a long time. Um, and um, there are, the, as, you, as many of you know, the Burmese military has used um, the, the the tactics of the Burmese military has used um, during the genocide and and violence against the ethnic by minorities, especially when it's come to Rohingya, is very very gendered, and um, it's affected uh, both male and female in different way. Uh, one of the under discussed uh, topic is is around the 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 use of the horrific use of uh, sexual and gender based violence. Um, and uh, largely targeted the women population, not limited to men and LGBTQ population. And these tactics, the military is like continue to use um, until today um, in ethnic areas, as well as 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 ongoing um, violence um, uh, happening in, in in Burma after the military coup. Uh, the military is using similar tactics in uh, against the deten. Uh, female and male um, uh, detainees and, and, and prisoners um, that include force um, uh, raping each other uh, or, or forcing them to rape each other or military themselves using uh, sexual violence. Um, with that being said, there are a number of challenges that I think we need to uh, address and and I like to highlight today prioritize in addition to what has been discussed and I agree with it, it most of the uh, all of, I mean we share some uh, all of the experiences that we you 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 earlier shared um, when it, when we look into the situations in Burma I think we have to look into uh, the situations in a way to uh, that address ongoing uh, sexual and gender based violences. Um, and as, as well as uh, the past uh, sexual and gender-based violence that uh, has been experienced by the Rohingya women and other ethnic women in Burma. Um, the, uh, generally speaking, the first challenge that we see is the lack of access to justice. Um, in, in general, in Burma, there is no gender-sensitive uh, legal framework uh, that allow uh, people to have access to justice in general. And there are, yeah, of course, there are a lot of social stigma and fear of uh, reprisal and ret uh, retaliation, um, as well as uh, specifically for the Rohingya women, there is, um, there is no place actually to, to, to go and complain uh, due to the um, various and due to the uh, restrictions that they have put in place in their life in general as, a, as, a, as a, a victims of the Rohingya uh, genocide communities. And also as an ethnic and religious minorities, it's extremely difficult for them to have access to the justice systems, which are not in their own languages, um, not only for the Rohingya women, but also many other ethnic communities. I think this is the, this is a key, 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 one of the key issues that we, we have to uh, put into the consideration when we address the gender-based um, uh, violence. Uh, the second challenge, um, is related to the ongoing justice uh, processes. I see that there is uh, there's a lack of 
uh, adequate international mechanisms to address sexual assault violence or gender-based violence in general. Uh, currently, we have no international court or tribunal that uh, can holistically address this issue, although we have a, a, a case before the International Court of Justice, it is not a criminal uh, criminal court, and although there is some in, uh, investigations ongoing by the uh, International Criminal Court, uh, it, I'm afraid that it might not necessarily cover the seriousness and the scope of the violence that the Rohingya women uh, face in Burma. And so I think that there is a, a need to, uh, to explore and push for a, 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 a court that address uh, um, or uh, push the existing court to have a, to have a serious um, take on the addressing sexual and gender-based violence. Uh, the third uh, uh, challenge is, is, as you mentioned, the lack of protections for the witnesses uh, uh, in both domestically as well as in the internationally. Um, I mean, we definitely don't have a, any domestic justice processes for Rohingya women, but uh, uh, other women in Burma are still getting some level of uh, access to court, but then um, it doesn't mean that they have actually protection at all. Um, so therefore, a lot of people are being silenced. Uh, uh, on the other hand, for Rohingya women, I think al although there are some processes ongoing, including uh, the universal jurisdiction cases, I am aware that some people and organization has reached out to the uh, females and victims of uh, sexual and uh, gender-based violence. However, um, there hasn't been a serious discussions around how uh, to ensure uh, protections for these women and, and girls. I am afraid that not many women uh, who have experienced uh, sexual violence are uh, able to come out and, and, and testify, uh, actually due to the uh, retributions from the Myanmar military, given that the Myanmar military has access to many neighboring countries. So I think this has a chilling effect on, 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 on the international uh, and undermine the ability for the international legal processes to provide justice. Um, so I, I will be just quick. <laughs> I guess finally the fifth, uh, the fourth challenge uh, is that um, the need to ensure um, adequate reparations for the victim. Uh, too often victims of uh, gender-based uh, violence are not provided adequate reparations for their suffering. It is essential we um, provide it. Um, adequate rep reparations included medical and psychological care and legal aid and economic uh, support, uh, both uh, in diaspora, in the refugee camps, as well as in Burma. Um, yeah, I'll stop here. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, Naomi, I turn to you. Uh, our speakers have raised so many issues that I know you and the museum have spoken about. Susan raised uh, the Yazidi, while I, of course, spoke about the Rohingya. Catherine spoke about Syria. I know you've spoken passionately on all of these issues, uh, and I know the issue of statelessness has also come up. Um, so I turn to you if, if you can talk about some of the elements uh, that uh, are through lines through here that you'd like to raise to cap us off this first question. Thank you so much, uh, Ariella and Ambassador Swarwar. Um, I very honored to join this conversation. And I wanted to start just by putting it in a bit of a historical context as I frame kind of the three areas that we're concerned at about at the museum. Uh, women who were victims and survivors of the Holocaust were considered to have had the same experiences as men. And it took a very long time for us to realize that that was not the case. We often forget that some of the earliest crimes of the Holocaust was the forced sterilization of women deemed to be undesirable due to race, religion, or mental capacity. And when we look at sexual violence, it took decades for survivors and researchers to raise these crimes, often due to the immense societal stigma and trauma that the other speakers have spoken to. And it's worth noting that these types of crimes were not included in the prosecutions at Nuremberg. Today, we know better and we've come quite a long way, but we still have uh, a lot ahead of us in terms of tackling this. History has shown us that gender is often weaponized in war, inspiring horrific crimes aimed at destroying communities. 
Through the conflict era memoirs and survivor testimonies, we continue to learn more about women's unique experiences during the Holocaust in Rwanda and Bosnia, the genocides of the 1990s, and then now today in Iraq, Syria, China, Ukraine, and Burma. We now understand that women and girls face unique threats, as do men and boys, and have their own distinct protection needs. From our perspective, it's really critical that we provide a gender competent and intersectional legal analysis of the crimes of genocide and crimes against humanity, including to help with a reckoning that's needed around gendered aspects of these crimes and to help ensure that future genocides are more accurately understood than they were in the past. So just as a starting point, our first key challenge that we see is the need to advance understanding of the gendered nature of the crimes. All too often, women and girls have not had the requisite attention paid towards them as specific victims of genocide. What we need to do is ensure that there is an appropriate focus on genocidal perpetrators, the specific strategies that are used to target women and girls. This often falls into the category of acts that are uh, not necessarily considered mass killing, which is where so much of our attention as an international community goes, including when we're thinking about possible prosecution. What we need to be putting a greater emphasis is on acts of sexual violence, attacks on women and girls' reproductive capacities, either through forced pregnancies, rapes uh, that are undertaken with the aim of bearing children who do not share the same identity, through restricting births, both undertaken with an intention to destroy a community. These are the types of crimes that we saw unfortunately perpetrated against the Yazidi community, that we've seen being perpetrated today against the Uyghur community. And we need to understand much more the nature of these types of crimes and look for indications that they are occurring. We also just more broadly need to ensure that conflict related sexual violence is given the appropriate due that is required. And we know there are challenges around data collection and that there are specific strategies that need to be implemented and put in place to ensure that there is the focus that is required on these types of crimes. So in addition to understanding the gendered lens of why particular crimes are being perpetrated and how they are manifested, we also need to have a more holistic understanding of what justice means from a gendered perspective and ensure that there are appropriate processes in place. And I don't wanna repeat many of the things that have already been said, but very briefly, that includes understanding that from the perspective of survivors and victims, justice includes psychosocial support. It includes helping to repair the social fabric of communities that have been attacked. For the Yazidi community, um, as Susan spoke to, that includes addressing issues of honor killings, the disowning of women um, and girls who have had children, finding ways to advance livelihoods. But it also, as Catherine and others have spoken to, ensures that there is a gender sensitive approach to witness protection, which I'm sure we'll talk about later, ensuring that international standards and best practices are used when we're talking about the broader rubrics of what falls under witness protection, seeking informed content, consent, protecting confidentiality, ensuring that documentation efforts do not um, lead to re-traumatization. I think we're all very sensitive to the fact that in some ways, efforts around advancing international criminal justice has become, from the perception of survivors and victims, a bit of an extractive industry where there's a lack of regard for the well-being and at times safety of survivors and victims. That in part is due to um, a need for us to recognize in a much broader sense, the actors that we're talking about when we talk about advancing justice, it's not just those that are engaged in advancing international um, and UN sanctioned fact finding and investigative mechanisms endeavors. It includes NGOs at the international and local level. It includes also the media who often are very much involved in first putting a spotlight on some of the crimes that are occurring and in continuing to tell the stories, which helps to reinforce the argument for why there should be international criminal justice efforts, but where all too often we see poor practices being used, uh, which leads to traumatization, including of those who have provided information that may be used um, for court proceedings, but through the practices of these journalists, um, they may very well undermine the broader effort for advancing international criminal justice. So we need to have a much better understanding from a gendered lens of a more holistic understanding of what justice means informed by the visions and the needs of, of victims and survivors and the appropriate processes in place to understand the unique threats that especially women and girls have. And then finally, just briefly, uh, our center looks again at the process of prevention, protection, and accountability as being mutually reinforcing efforts. We know that 
right now, the majority of cases that we have talked about are cases in which the crimes are still ongoing. So I think there's a very important uh, aspect to this conversation of advancing justice and a gendered approach to it that needs to be put on ensuring that there are preventive efforts underway and non-recurrence and that efforts to advance justice, including efforts to document um, that there is an analysis that goes on that with the reports that come out uh, from fact-finding missions, from commission of inquiries, are used to help us understand the nature of the crimes that are being perpetrated today, that there is that kind of feedback loop so that we are using the information that is being distilled in a way that can help prevent crimes that are currently ongoing. And in doing so, looking again for motives, strategies, tactics being used, working backwards to identify ways to help protect. Uh, and it may very well be help protect individuals and local communities with their own self-protection efforts. This has been a bit of a blind spot um, where there hasn't been sufficient attention and there needs to be more of a reckoning, especially when we're talking about uh, situations where we're not looking at mass killing, we're looking at other forms of mass atrocities that are being perpetrated against women and girls. Um, we know of the very difficult case of the Yazidi where to this day, there are thousands of women and girls and young boys who remain missing, who remain held by ISIS um, in various locations in uh, Syria and where at very particular moments, especially much earlier into the conflict, there were opportunities to potentially protect and save the lives of these women, girls, and young boys that were missed. So what we'd like to see is more of an understanding of advancing international criminal justice and the role that it can play in preventing crimes that are ongoing. Thank you. Thank you, Naomi. We'll have an opportunity to dive a little bit deeper in your next uh, question and answer. Um, so let me turn, that's a nice segue to turn to Susan. I wanted to ask you a question about the recent steps that the US government has taken toward enhancing international uh, witness protections. Your office has issued a lot of recent statements about uh, policies centering women and underrepresented groups at the center of its policies. Could you elaborate a little bit for our audience about those steps? Sure, and I'll, um, I'll focus on some of our efforts first on witness protection. Um, and as, so as we've all discussed, um, while there are reprisals and attacks to witnesses who are particip participating in both investigations and prosecutions in the international criminal justice sphere, Nonetheless, their testimony uh, and participation remains vital. My ambassador, Ambassador Beth von Scock, has taken the protection of witnesses and victim protection of witnesses, victims, and insider witnesses as really one of her core missions uh, during her tenure. Um, so we've held a number of events where we are gathering information and discussion and raising awareness on these issues. For example, on the margins of UNGA, the UN General Assembly meeting this fall, we held an event discussing witness protection, insider witnesses and victims. And at that event, a gentleman by the name of the Gravedigger spoke of his participation in the landmark Anwar Raslan trial in Germany that resulted in a life sentence for crimes against humanity against a former senior re Assad regime official. But as a result of his participation in the investigation and prosecution, he and his fam his wife and son were actually both threatened and physically attacked and are now in hiding. Um, so he participated in the discussion um, via video. Um, at that event, we also announced that the Un United States will be providing an additional $1 million to the independent investigative mechanism for Myanmar to support victim and witness protection for some of the reasons that have been discussed already. Um, we have also, um, last week, we, we our, our ambassador participated in a number of discussions at the Assembly for State Parties for the International Criminal Court 
on these issues, including issues facing the relocation of victims and witnesses, which is a key, a key issue. Um, so some of the issues related to that are the need to facilitate the creation of identity and travel documents, the importance of moving quickly when risks materialize and the costs associated with lengthy delays in relocation processes. Um, because of these issues, the registry of the International Criminal Court has developed some creative funding mechanisms for states to participate. Uh, for example, there's uh, pooled funding where states can, if they're not able to relocate victims and witnesses to their own country, they can participate, they can share funding for the cost of the burden of doing so. Um, in October, we also held another event um, devoted to prosecuting war crimes with the Lieber Institute at the West at West Point. Um, and the and the need for additional resources to protect them that we're seeing in many jurisdictions around the world. Um, we're also discussing with a number of our interagency colleagues what reforms, legislative or otherwise, might be needed to encourage states and other actors to play a more a more helpful role. We're also engaging with civil society and other entities such as the International Criminal Court on these issues. We're learning a number of interesting practices, for example, from our US Marshal Service, uh, which works in the international sector on these issues. And for us learning even from, for example, what has been done with um, former narco trafficking and mafia cases. On the gender-based violence set of issues, which of course, uh, intersect with the witness protection issues. Uh, on November 28th, the White House released the, a presidential memorandum to promote accountability for conflict related sexual violence, reflecting a US commitment to leverage government sanctions, uh, assistance restrictions, and other tools to promote accountability for perpetrators of sexual, uh, uh, sexual violence. And today, the US is releasing an updated strategy to prevent and respond to gender-based violence globally, and the first ever domestic US national action plan to end gender-based violence that I'd urge our participants to look at at their leisure. The strategy establishes three pillars to inform US foreign policy and assistance in this area, including focusing on gender and at-risk populations and are integrating gender-based violence prevention across all sectors and strengthening our efforts. Uh, my ambassador also recently participated in uh, a conflict and sexual-based violence conference in London, um, where we announced that we will providing an additional $400,000 to our annual contribution to the UN Special Representatives to the Secretary, on, Secretary General on Violence and Conflict, or the SRSG. Um, and these resources will advance the SRG's work to promote justice and accountability for these crimes and uh, foster greater engagements for governments to provide sustainable survivor-based responses to conflict-related sexual uh, and gender-based violence. Our Democracy and Human Rights and Violence Bureau invest 10, is investing $10 million over the next two years in projects that support civil society efforts in these areas to inv investigate and document uh, sexual and gender-based violence for the purposes of pursuing truth and justice for victims and survivors. We also uh, are reviving it and expanding a Safe from the Start initiative to provide life-saving services and, and other uh, support to survivors in emergency and conflict settings. Um, and then finally, another initiative I'll mention here is our Expanding the Voices Against Violence initiative 
which is dedicated to ensuring that survivors of gender-based violence and harmful practices have an increased access to justice protection and, and services. Um, it has benefited more than 2.3 million people across 66 countries and has directly supported more than 3,000 survivors of conflict and gender-based violence. Um, and I will end there and I'll look forward to the rest of our discussion today. Thank you, Susan. Um, well, that is a very robust list. Um, and as always, please send our regards to the ambassador who is a great ally on these issues. And we know that she would have loved to join us and we send her the best. Um, thank you so much. We'll turn to Catherine. Um, we also want to hear from you. We know there has been great progress that we want to hear about on the IIIM's work to support and empower witnesses um, and the work the, the, the mechanism is doing to implement a gender sensitive approach to witness protection. What can we learn there? What progress is being made? Over to you, Catherine, please. Thank you, Ariella. Well, uh, indeed, uh, the issue is timely for us as uh, we have recently launched our gender strategy and the, importantly, it's a implementation plan publicly. This is a strategy that we have launched internally uh, a year ago. That's why the implementation plan is not just you know, aspirational, it's very practical and, and grounded in reality of, a, of our work. Um, this strategy and implementation plan, but also the protection program that we are developing and that integrates in addition to uh, purely protection aspect, um, the integration of advice, but also support to witnesses. Um, are key priorities for us, and, and they are firmly rooted in our victim survivor centered approach. I will focus on the gender specific aspect of the issue only, but I'd like to stress from the outset that uh, for us, um, there is an important place of intersectionality in witness protection in order to fully understand protection needs and identify appropriate support options. You need to look at the gender dimension of it, but you also need to look at the potential uh, ethnic age uh, um, and even uh, um, diverse uh, sexual and gender identities dimension that, that come with it. So given the, the limited amount of time, I, I'd like to focus on four uh, key areas in showing how we made progress in ensuring a gender sensitive approach to witness protection. Well, first of all, we want to ensure that we consider gender-based crimes and discrimination in context. And that's important, including to, to devise the specific forms of advice, support, and, and protection. And this is both with regard to the context of the occurrence of these crimes, but also with respect to the systematic integration of gender-sensitive approaches in our own working methods when, when we address them. So it's crucial to understand how gender structures act as a driver of violence. And, and these um, drivers may also operate when it comes to uh, putting the, uh, the witnesses and, and victim and survivors who accept to, 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 to come as witnesses into, into risk. Uh, but this shouldn't be done in isolation. If we look at gender in isolation, we really can jeopardize achieving inclusive justice. And in fact, uh, we realize that gender-based discrimination and specific crimes regularly form part of broader discriminatory system and, and connect with other forms of violence within the, the system, for instance, or as part of a broader destructive campaign against a group. Um, so we have embedded in our team an office-wide network of experts on sexual and gender-based violence across key professional areas, investigators, analysts, lawyers, and evidence management officers. Uh, we also obviously have a, a support officer that is a psychologist by, by uh, uh, training and, and has a long experience in that area. And, um, and a protection officer, we are still in the, we are now in the process of recruiting a new uh, protection officer. This helps us, this, this team, this composition of the team to also identify specific vulnerabilities of relevant witnesses and jointly to ensure that we are able to uh, provide appropriate protection measures or devise them and seek uh, support uh, in order to put them in place. Secondly, we approach uh, sexual violence as a gender crime. We consider that 
gender frequently influences the form that this kind of violence takes and the impact that it has on survivors and witnesses, including with respect to the reactions of families and communities. And I mentioned earlier uh, this systematic questions put to, to Syrian former female detainees. Um, one of our, uh, one of the Syrian uh, partners that we consulted explained that when courageous survivors were willing to come forward uh, at risk, uh, even from fellow former detainees who don't want people to think that they may have been violated themselves uh, because of one statement, as she says, condemned the others. Thirdly, we understand that gender-based violence is not synonymous with sexual violence. We've repeatedly, repeatedly heard in our interactions with victims and survivors that they are primarily as about that, even though not every gender-based violation is sexual. And they have pleaded with us to also reflect on other types of gendered arms uh, that impact them during the armed conflict. But, Fourth, we have to be proactive in creating the right conditions for victims and survivors of uh, sexual violence and other gender-based violence to come forward and to participate in accountability. As I mentioned, um, it's really important to be able to provide them uh, with uh, guidance as to how they can protect themselves. Uh, and this is an empowering uh, dimension of the protection uh, where there are actors and not just uh, you know, subject to, to and victims. Uh, we also need, uh, of course, to not just identify referral pathways, but also to be able to, uh, to, to make sure that they are appropriate and, and of quality. So this is a sensitive area where you, you need to really to, to engage with partners. Um, and as I said in my introduction, and it's unfortunately not um, that there is a lack of such uh, support for, for Syrian victims. Um, I'm just trying to make sure I'm not uh, forgetting something important. Uh, <clears throat> yes, uh, the, during the interview process, obviously, uh, uh, doing no harm, avoiding to re-traumatize uh, uh, victims and survivors uh, that are interviewed. At the same time, um, uh, equipping the investigators with the tools to recognize that uh, someone is going to need particular support, making systematic assessment of uh, the risk and the vulnerability, not assuming that, for instance, a professional witness is going to be strong by nature. Uh, an historian, a doctor may be at risk, specific risk, if you're not assessing that it's not going to work, and not assuming that a victim of, for instance, sexual violence is by nature going to be vulnerable. Uh, some of them are stronger because they have uh, support in their family, for instance, a, a supporting husband, or they've gone through um, psychological support. So again, no assumption, but, but rather uh, um, a professional uh, approach. Um, as explained during one of the Triple M's consultation, uh, Jumana uh, Saif, a Syrian co-founder of the Syrian Feminist Lobby, who was recently awarded the to uh, 2023 Unclaimed Women's Award for Work uh, has told us that the patriarchal mentality that dominates the Syrian society in is really a challenge. In 2011, 20, and 2012, this mentality played an important role, according to her, in keeping crimes from being documented, especially crimes of sexual violence. Some documenters declined to document these crimes for reputational reasons. Sexual crimes continue to provoke a huge reaction, even for women who are willing to enter into uh, uh, international process prosecution and acknowledge the discrimination that they faced. They don't want to say it in public and to avoid to provoke uh, a reaction. And they continue to face reprisals from the Syrian regime against their family who are still in Syria. This is why I think we have to work. I'm gonna end uh, with that because I know we have more speakers and, and probably questions. Uh, we have to work collectively on finding solutions to these barriers that I, I was mentioning at the beginning. And we increasingly work in collaboration with Victim Survivors Association and other uh, CSOs and accountability uh, actors to proactively address these significant barriers. We know that justice is important to victims and survivors, uh, but we have to create the right conditions to maximize those chances that they will come forward and, be, and will do so safely. Thank you. 
Thank you so much, Catherine. Um, and congratulations again on moving into the implementation phase. Um, I want to move on to uh, Naomi to talk about uh, something happening in the present moment and to, to uh, reiterate what you were beginning to talk about in terms of documentation uh, and engagement. Um, I know we are moving into brief territory with remarks and I appreciate your uh, ability to be short, um, but can you talk to us about the documentation efforts that you are um, seeing and, and um, respond to the, the challenge of identifying and protecting witnesses uh, to crimes and abuses while uh, war rages on and, uh, ha and to the question of whether you feel the Ukraine war has changed the debate about mechanisms for global justice and accountability for war crimes. Thanks so much, Ariella, for that question. And I think it's something that's front of mind for a lot of people right now. I think when we evaluate kind of what's happening, we need to take a step back um, and understand the response to Ukraine in the context of a decade where efforts to advance international criminal justice has really been increasingly at the fore. And I think one could arguably say that that began with Iraq and the crimes perpetrated by ISIS um, was enhanced by the various efforts that have been underway, led by Catherine and, and so many in the context of Syria. And then also the experience of the Rohingya in Burma, where again, conversations about how to advance international criminal justice, how to explore the potential for cases in third party countries, um, where a lot of innovation in those three instances has brought us to the moment where in the context of Ukraine, there's been really significant attention, but also action. Now, one could arguably say that that is also the result of a reckoning that's been taken by uh, various aspects of the international community in regards to the challenge of prevention and a sense that uh, there are a number of challenges and roadblocks to advancing prevention, therefore heightening the focus on former international criminal justice efforts afterwards. Whether or not it will bear fruit insofar as lead to successful prosecutions, it's really hard to say at this particular stage. We have had some successes. Um, Susan spoke about the Roslan case. There have been other cases that have um, resulted in uh, verdicts um, and individuals being charged. But I think there are still a lot of uh, questions around just the potential for unmet expectations we have really as a center been focusing a lot on understanding what are the needs and desires of survivors and victims and the importance of having a much more holistic understanding of what justice and accountability means and having a broader focus on transitional justice. Uh, in that regard, I do think we've made significant strides when it comes to helping to set a historical record, countering denial, and including um, ensuring that there is a increase, increasing uh, appropriate focus on the gendered nature of the crimes. And I think Catherine talked about some of the changes in process and the efforts that are currently underway um, that she and her team are taking forward in the context of the Syria mechanisms. Uh, we do know that there is a lot of uh, international political will in the context of Ukraine and are hopeful that this helps set and defines a new agenda, one that puts a priority on support at the international, regional, and critically kind of localization of justice and accountability efforts that are informed by transitional justice principles. In the context of Ukraine and documentation, this is definitely a situation where one cannot argue that there is not enough documentation. Um, if anything, we're seeing a proliferation of organizations and entities that are currently undertaking documentation efforts, um, notably led by civil society, including local civil society. There are some attributes that are quite unique in the Ukrainian context, and that is the fact that you have a functioning uh, judiciary and functioning um, justice system whereby the state itself is able to undertake a lot of this work. But alongside the efforts that are being taken by the state, um, you just see a wide array of local civil society, international NGOs, uh, international entities, fact-finding mission, commission of inquiry, and others that are currently doing documentation. We know that there is an increased focus on uh, investigating and documenting uh, sexual violence against women and men. We understand that there is also a gendered understanding of the targeting, especially of men um, who've got real and perceived um, allegiances to the Ukrainian military who served in the past. 
We also understand that there is quite a lot of focus and uh, an effort to understand more the reports of children being transferred from their families um, away and uh, into parts of Russia and adoption. Uh, that in and of itself shows that there is an increased understanding and reckoning, again, of that gendered nature of the crimes. So that is a positive that we see more of an emphasis on looking at patterns, motives, strategies, and tactics. I'd say that even in the context of journalists that are covering these issues, um, thanks to the efforts of, of many, there is an improved um, understanding by them of the nature of the crimes, a greater effort to ensure that what they're reporting on is accurate and the way they are talking about these issues is accurate uh, and that there has been some adoption of some best practices by journalists that are in the field in part because of the failures in the context of Iraq and Burma and an effort to want to learn lessons from those contexts. One of the other things that we think is positive is that there's been a greater effort to try to coordinate the documentation efforts. But as the prosecutor himself has said, the Ukrainian prosecutor general, they are very, very wary of the proliferation of different actors that are undertaking documentation because of the challenges that each of us have spoken to around the risks uh, that exist and arise when you see uh, documentation being taken uh, by many individuals and organizations, often not in accordance with international best standards. Much of the documentation may not be able to be used. It's also very hard to filter through and determine what um, is actually going to be uh, of use for future cases and prosecutions. But I think the biggest challenge is really around witness protection. So maybe just a quick um, kind of thought in that regard. One of the things that we talk a lot about as a center is the importance of managing expectations, managing the expectations of the affected communities so that they understand that the path to justice is a long one and that they also understand that uh, prosecutions, which is what there's often such an, an emphasis on, is often hard to see to a kind of, from their perspective, successful fruition, i.e. that someone is charged um, and convicted uh, and then sentenced. So we need to really make sure that we're being careful when we talk about what is possible in the context of uh, Ukraine, as in, in all other instances, but also that we're placing an emphasis, especially on a couple of few areas. When we talk about uh, witness protection, we're talking about the security of information and confidentiality. We need to recognize that many of the organizations functioning right now in Ukraine do not necessarily have staff that are dedicated to uh, looking at those particular issues, looking at the live threats that witnesses face, to, face. They are operating as most should under the principles of do no harm, but not necessarily because the, the the events are unfolding so quickly and these documentation efforts are being stood up quite quickly with always the adequate processes uh, that they need to have in hand, including to ensure that there isn't re-traumatization of victims. Um, also with the informed consent, ensuring that everyone understands why they're being interviewed, who they're being interviewed by, how the testimony that they're going to provide um, is going to be used, and whether or not that information will be shared with others, including the International Criminal Court. It's really critical that there be confidentiality at all stages and a security of the information that is being gathered, ensuring that there are certain protocols that are being taken place, that um, people's names are, uh, and certain things that they say are being protected, that there are databases in place to collect and hold information in an encrypted manner. Uh, there's varying degrees of oh, sorry to this. interrupt you. I just have to uh, interrupt to excuse um, uh, Catherine Mashu Hal, who has to leave at the top of the hour, as I'm sure others do. Um, thank you so much, Catherine. I appreciate it. Um, Very sorry for, for interrupting. Yes. Thank, thank you. you so much. That's okay. Thank you, Catherine. And thank, thank you, you for all your efforts and you and your team. Naomi, um, may I ask something a little bit unorthodox here? Yeah. May I ask you if we could, um, if, if I could ask you to absolutely finish the sentence. I'm so sorry, she did have to leave immediately. And if no, we no, could no. ask um, for you to then put any additional comments in the, the chat. And if I could ask Weiwei to be able to give her remarks for those who will, who will stay on an extra few minutes, but will close out the conversation since we did also get a comment in the Q&A about hearing from impacted and I know the communities, which I know is the center of your chat, and then we will then carry on a discourse with those who can stay on an extra few minutes. Would that be a, a, an appropriate way to, to end our discussion? Can we do that? 
So yes, I'll let finish the sentence and then we'll turn to Weiwei for her extra three minutes on the conversation. Does that sound fair? That's great. Um, okay. I would just say that I think that what we're seeing right now in the Ukraine hopefully we'll set a new standard for what we can see for victims and survivors in Ethiopia, in China and elsewhere, and that we see equity in the responses. It has been positive to see the United States assert their support for the International Criminal Court and a real um, alliance amongst Republicans and Democrats in favor of international criminal justice. And we hope that that is sustained going forward with the needs of victims and survivors at the fore. Thanks, Arielle. Thank you so much, Naomi. My plan is to now ask Weiwei to um, speak to us. Um, I'm going to weave in also uh, two audience questions. Weiwei, um, you, we know that your activism comes from your lived experience. Um, we would like to know as a closing comment about how civil societies and your own experiences to those that you can share can play a bridging role between um, when the state is not uh, playing an effective role and uh, where it, you, we can support survivors and um, uh, uh, in coming forward to um, share their stories so that we can uh, receive justice and accountability. Um, can you talk a little bit also about the role that digital source information has had on uh, the protection efforts. Um, so what I'm doing is weaving two questions on is just about how your civil society and your own experiences bear to play in what we've spoken about today. And also to understand a little bit about how the digital uh, open source information has also bared positive and negative experiences in, in, this, um, in this discussion today. So if you can close us out on those two thoughts and then we will continue Naomi, if you want to bring in other thoughts. And since this is a rich discussion ambassador, I think what we'll do is also look forward to seeing if we can put on a, uh, a second discussion to continue this rich discourse. Thank you. Thank you, Ariella. I just wanna be very honest today. Last night I received a video of, uh, of a gang rape of uh, Rohingya women who was um, trying to flee from Rakhine. And um, it was horrific and brutal. And uh, basically, I couldn't sleep the entire night. Um, uh, the person who sent me said, don't watch, but I couldn't uh, watch it. And I couldn't sleep the entire night. It was horrific. And I just want to say that this is uh, the result of the failure of ending impunity for the perpetrators of these crimes. and and lack of political will to address the, 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 the suffering of the communities and group. Uh, sorry, I just can't forget this video. And um, so I just wanna bring that these crimes are ongoing and the communities are continue to suffer in many levels. The impact is so high because of the lack of uh, uh, political will and and um, lack of justice and accountability, they, they, the, the community continue to be vulnerable until today, not only by the main perpetrators, the military, but also by other actors. So, so that is something, that is what happening in Burma. At the same time, the military continue to commit this sexual and gender-based violence, as I mentioned earlier, and there is not enough uh, we talk about you know policies, funding, donations, all of this. But in practice, people in Burma, women in Burma, women and men in Burma, as somehow ignore, and their sufferings are somehow ignored. There is not no not enough support on the ground, and civil society has very limited um, access to the conf uh, the to the to the area or very limited. Um, uh, she lem very limited environment to really function or to do anything on the ground. Yet it, it is the local civil society organizations, including us trying to help the women in detentions, women who are, uh, who became victims and survivors of sexual violence um, in different uh, locations um, uh, under the ongoing violence uh, by by the military or the by the other actors, um, so 
yeah, when you ask about the role of uh, civil society, I think it is the local civil society organizations playing a key role uh, by being the first uh, responders and doing everything they can within the limited capacity and limited uh, access and environment. And I think there is a, a, a you know, a, 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 there is a huge need to equip these people, groups and organizations, especially women's organizations, uh, to be able to do their work and or to be able to scale up their work so that we can practically protect uh, the survivors on the ground unless we put enough effort to uh, uh, resource, to channel resources to the ground uh, um, in ongoing conflict area we might not be um, able to protect uh, or prevent any of these crimes and and um, we'll end up seeing more victims. Boy, I'm so sorry. sorry. I've become very emotional thinking about this video. Well, I'm 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 honored that you shared with us, but I'm terrified on your behalf that you had to witness and that your colleagues continue to witness uh, this. Um, we have a uh, many many more things to discuss about this, and uh, I now wonder if we had started the discussion with this, where we would be at the end of the discussion. So let us carry on the conversation in different ways as you're comfortable. It is a good place to end because you've shared something that I don't know even if you're comfortable with. So let's honor the space and not re-traumatize where you are at. Um, and just say that I think you've demonstrated exactly where we wanted to be at, which is we have so much to talk about here and so much to discuss but to support you and to support everyone, we are no different from where we were in 1998. We're no different from where we were in 1946 and that we have so much to work to do to support together. And I think this is very much a community that needs to come together to discuss the financial, the political, the uh, support of civil society and the individual level. So let us leave there to say that the work is strong, but there is so much that needs to be done. Let us thank our US government colleagues. Let us thank our United Nations colleague, our ambassador colleagues, our US government, uh, uh, as in our US Holocaust Museum and collaborative private sector colleagues. Um, and of course, Women in International Security, my colleagues to be here today. Um, thank you so much, but I'm going to close out this discussion and I promise you that I will follow up with each of you as panelists and audience members, including our audience members who have suggested other country contexts and other opportunities for us to have this discussion. So I thank you for spending your time today and I promise that we will carry on this discussion in many fruitful ways. So thank you very much for spending the time with us today. <laughs>